With the length of its second season reduced to 8 episodes, too shorter than its first run, we have reached the halfway point of HBO's fantasy drama series House of the Dragon as episode 4 has aired this week. Finally, the war seems to have arrived. As characters are now done adding new allies to their respective teams without any bloodshed, and a defining moment ends the episode. As Renera returns from King's Landing following her failed attempt at peace with Alicent Hightower, she has to make a decision about who to send for a confrontation with Sir Criston Cole's marching army. And it is also in this regard that we witness the first significant loss in the series. A spoiler warning is in order as we will be discussing essential plot points and character details from the series. If you've watched episode 4 of the second season already, let's dive straight into the video. And while you're at it, please like the video and subscribe to our channel as it helps us a lot. What is up with Damon? Back in last week's episode 3, Damon Targaryen had split from his niece and wife Rhaenyra and had left Dragonstone. only to travel to the castle at Harrenhal. Damon's intention in claiming Harrenhal, which is considered to be one of the most important locations in Westeros strategically, was made clear when he ordered to be given the respect a king deserved. With a confrontation with Rhaenyra that quickly turned into personal attacks fresh on his mind, Damon wanted to claim himself as the true successor to the Iron Throne in King's Landing, and therefore wanted to use Harrenhal as the place from which to launch his campaign. But his plan seemed to be marred by the eeriness of the wet and unnaturally damp castle, where Damon experienced what seemed to be a haunting nightmare. Such bizarre matters continue in House of the Dragon season 2 episode 4 as well, and it in fact begins with another one of Damon's nightmares. This time around, the silver-haired character is seen entering what seems to be the royal hall at King's Landing, where the Iron Throne sits at its end. But Damon is immediately shocked at seeing the ruler of Westeros, who happens to be a young Renera back from when he first sneaked her out of the castle, and they shared their first romantic moment. Approaching her in utter disbelief, Damon demands an answer when the young woman claims that he is still driven by jealousy. His desire to go against her and lead to her defeat is apparently because his brother, the late King Viserys, never gave him the love that he showered on her. There is possibly no lie in this statement though. and Damon himself knows so which is why he hears the words in his dream as a direct reflection of his troubled conscience enraged by the outrageous claim Damon unsheaths his sword and beheads young Renera in one swift swoop only for the severed head to continue taunting him all in old valerian the very last words that it utters are in english though as it informs of a raven having brought some news and this is what finally wakes Damon up to the realization that he has been sleeping inside his chamber at Harrenhal all this time. Simon Strong, the current head of the castle and the Strong family, repeats the same words about a raven having brought news, which turns out to be about the army that Sir Criston Cole has been leading towards Harrenhal. Simon naturally wants to protect his castle against marching enemies, and it is an impossible task for him alone, as all of his family's wealth is controlled by Laris Strong. who is at King's Landing and currently supporting Alicent. Therefore, he wants Damon, who has claimed rulership over the castle, to strike up alliances, and so a meeting with House Tully is arranged. The house is currently represented by a young boy, Oscar, who is to be the official head after the demise of his sick grandfather, and Damon has no patience for the sensitive nature of the situation. He simply advises Oscar to kill his grandfather and claim his position. which quickly results in the prospect of the Tullys joining Damon's side fading away. He too instead decides to focus on the Blackwood family, which might be more helpful in his plans at the moment. But before the meeting with Lord Blackwood though, Damon has to spend one more night at Harrenhal, where he is gradually settling in despite the hauntings. This time, he spots a shadow of someone walking past outside his chambers and immediately jumps up to check on the situation. For the next few minutes, Damon seems to follow himself around the halls. with the two versions differentiated by their clothing but when the real daemon finally comes face to face with the figure he had been following things get even more weird for the figure wears an eye patch on his face just like aemond this creates a parallel between the two as both aemond and daemon saw themselves as superior to their siblings who sat on the iron throne the eye patch is a clever allusion to the fact that both of them are partially blinded by their ego The names too are anagrams of one another, creating another connection between the two princes and hinting at the possible showdown between the two. Damon is bewildered to see himself in such attire and rushes into what seems like the castle's pantry, where a woman is preparing some drinks by herself. This woman is the same one seen in the previous episode, 
telling Damon that he would go crazy inside the mysterious Harren Hall castle, and she finally gives an introduction. Alice Rivers is an illegitimate child of the Strong family who has been living in the castle for quite some time now, and she seems to be some sort of a medic with some supernatural powers. Alice reveals that the very ground on which the castle is built is supposedly haunted by tree spirits, as a very old forest had been cut down to make way for the building. She mentions that the very bed on which Damon has been trying to sleep for the last few days is made of wood from these cursed trees, which might be a reason for his nightmares. During this time, Alice keeps brewing some potion, which she gives to Damon, suggesting that drinking it would solve his problems. However, the potion has quite the opposite reaction, as Damon loses track of time and his short-term memory is affected, for the man suddenly finds himself in a meeting with Lord Blackwood. Without any memory of calling for this meeting, he stutters through the discussion and agrees to support the Blackwoods in their fight against their arch-rivals, the Bracken family. This is the only way for Damon to gain allies at the moment, and he goes forward with the plan despite evidently losing his sanity and rational thought. What pushes Aegon towards desperate acts? Back in King's Landing, King Aegon II is visibly frustrated by the gradual realization that his council is taking decisions without even consulting with him. At the head of the council are obviously Sir Criston Cole, who is currently away towards Harrenhal, and also the king's younger brother, Aemond, who has an inherent potential to be an efficient ruler. Aegon obviously lacks this quality, and so he is more desperate to act like a king, knowing all too well that he is considered powerless by most in his kingdom. During one of the council meetings, Aegon questions Criston's sudden message about changing the route and heading towards the small coastal castle of Rook's Rest. Much like all the viewers, Aegon is confused by this sudden change, for Rook's Rest is a place hardly anyone has ever heard of, and so is quite insignificant at the moment. What further irks Aegon is the fact that his brother Aemond is in support of this change, and it is soon revealed that Aemond and Kristen had been making plans together this whole time. Angry and frustrated, Aegon confronts Aemond in front of the whole council, only to be schooled by his younger brother in crisp old Valerian. Although the king tries to come up with a sharp reply about him being capable enough to wage his own war, Aegon absolutely makes a mess of it, owing to the fact that he is not proficient enough in the language. This further adds to his bitterness, and he soon tries to take shelter under his mother's comfort, who has been missing from the council meetings once again. Incidentally, Alicent has to deal with her own problems, as she is seen drinking the abortive tea that is so well brewed by the medic at King's Landing. She was evidently pregnant with Kristen's child, and now gets rid of it to avoid complications. As it has become a staple of the show, Laris Strong gets a hint of it, keeping the secret with him for now, waiting for a better time to use it. He also reveals that he knows Viserys did not actually want Aegon II to be king, but Alicent has a strong answer for this. She states that whatever Viserys wished for does not matter anymore, and this now confirms that the war is indeed inevitable. When Aegon complains to Alicent about the lack of respect and authority shown to him by his council, it further frustrates him, as his mother snaps at him. Alicent reminds her son that one cannot think or act like a true king simply by being handed the position, and she also speaks about the immense strategies she had to make to place him on the Iron Throne. Therefore, Alicent's advice to Aegon is to stop with his complaints and put his faith in his council, who are the true decision makers. This conversation is exactly what pushes Aegon towards immense desperation, as he gets drunk in his chamber and then comes up with a foolish plan to prove his bravado to the world. Aegon takes control of his dragon Sunfire and heads towards Rook's Rest, possibly to lead the army and prove his position as the true king. What happens at Rook's Rest? When Sir Criston Cole announces his intention to lead his army to Rook's Rest instead of Harrenhal, it surprises Gwen Hightower, Alicent's brother, who has been accompanying the army. However, it is later revealed that Criston and Aemond had a very specific plan in mind for Rook's Rest. The aim is to create a disruption at the place by attacking the castle of the Staunton family, who are allies to Renera, and drawing out a dragon from her side in order to defend the allies. Aemond would stay prepared aboard the gigantic Vagar during this time, waiting for Criston's signal to attack, and would draw the first blood against Renera and her team Black. The attack officially begins with Criston ordering his soldiers to move forward towards the castle, which is not the strongest move, as many are instantly killed by flying arrows from the defenders. And when Renera finally returned to Dragonstone and was told about the army from King's Landing marching towards Rook's Rest, she decided to fly there herself with her dragon and defend the place. While she ignored the advice of others, including her son, 
Rhaenyra eventually listened to her aunt Rhaenys, who wanted to fight Criston and his army instead. Thus, it was Rhaenys who took her dragon towards the battle at Rook's Rest, unaware of the fact that it was all a trap. As she arrives at the place and attacks the soldiers on the ground, Aegon and Sunfire now join the party, causing extreme trouble for Criston and Aemond's plan. Aemond also has to come out of hiding and ride Vhagar through the skies, and this is when he does something quite shocking, which turns the very course of House of the Dragon season 2. Aemond orders Vhagar to attack, and the dragon immediately shoots fire at Meles, disregarding the fact that Sunfire and Aegon would also get hurt by the attack. The more experienced rider, Rhaenys, is able to fly away from the situation, and it is indeed Aegon who is struck down by the fire as his dragon falls into the forest. Aemond clearly wanted his brother to die, possibly because he would be the next on the throne after Aegon's demise. And this is all the more certain in the latter scene, when Criston finds him approaching Sunfire with an unsheathed sword. While Aemond sheathes the sword quickly, it is not very clear as to whether he intended to kill Aegon with it, possibly to end his suffering, or if it was just a coincidence. We see very little of Aegon II though, but his body seems to have been terribly burned, and even if he were not dead, the young man would surely not be able to serve as the king anymore. While the twist is quite effective in itself, House of the Dragon also pulls in one last shocker, as Rhaenys decides to make use of this situation and face her grandnephew Aemond. This does not go very well for the experienced warrior though, as Vhagar is way too powerful for the aging Malays. After some heavy battle, which can very well be called the Dance of Dragons, Vhagar successfully defeats Malays, with the latter falling to the ground, killing Rhaenys as well. This loss of perhaps the most intelligent and also likeable characters on her side will surely enrage Rhaenyra enough to retaliate, and the war is now truly on. She is also seen telling Jaceres about the prophecy of the Song of Fire and Ice, which is a matter of true inheritance in the Targaryen family. In that sense, Jaceres is definitely at an advantage over Team Green, for neither Alicent nor any of her sons know about the prophecy, at least for now. Thank you for watching this video and do share your thoughts in the comment section about House of the Dragon Season 2. Hit the like button and subscribe to our channel to get your weekly dose of cinema and series. See you in the next one and for the time being we're signing off. Bye!